one of the biggest things I want to impart today is that don't underestimate our children's ability to understand right. on a very fundamental level what is what feels right or wrong to them. everybody. I'm so happy you're here. I'm Cynthia Santiago Borbon. I'm a licensed therapist and coach, life coach. And, um, I started my career in social work over 25 years ago and work with families and children for the, for the larger portion of my career. And for the past nine years, I've been running my own coaching and therapy practice, which I call Dream Makers, which provides coaching and training programs that empower people to break through personal and systemic barriers. So thank you for being here. We're gonna have a conversation today about how to talk to our children about race, which is such a challenging topic. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Jorge Narvaez. I have three kids. I have a 15-year-old, I have an 11-year-old, and I have a three-year-old. Hi, everyone. My name is Sheila Rivera. I live in Pennsylvania with my husband and my two children. My son, he's almost three, he'll be three in October. And I have an amazing little girl. She just started walking, she's 11 months old. My name is Omira. I am Puerto Rican and my husband is Greek. And I have two children. I have a daughter that is 12 and I have a daughter that's eight that will be turning nine on Saturday. So the research is telling us that children do see race and that contrary to a lot of beliefs about race, the myths about it, that children are not colorblind. There's a study that was authored by Jacqueline Duguay, a, a pediatrician based in Maryland, that shows that babies as early as six, six months old can notice race-based differences. So parents need to know that children as young as two to three years old can already start developing racial bias and internalizing racial, racial bias. Uh, by four and five years old, children are starting to say racist things, and children of color are starting to experience racism from their peers. I think it's important to know that because I think there's a lot of misconception that children don't actually see race. Why? Why is it that that they start noticing these differences at a young age. From what I know, racial tension and race in general is taught. So I'm assuming you're saying that kids are starting to be exposed, whether it's to digital media or whether it's through their families. How, how is it possible that they're so young and they start seeing, off, seeing the differences? Well, so first of all, we all notice as people, I mean, even as, as young children, we notice our differences. Young children are constantly comparing. That's how they make sense of the world. So they're seeing, oh, mommy has darker skin than me, or mommy has lighter skin than me, or my brother or sister has curly hair, or I have straight hair. Like they're noticing that very early on. Then just like everything else, they're socialized, right? So we are all socialized, we're all conditioned into everything we believe. So whether we're doing it directly or indirectly, what, what they're doing is they're picking up conceptions about race. As they're like little sponges, so they're constantly picking up information. No matter where you're from, no matter what you call country of origin, right? Because, you know, Latinos are like the gamut, right? From, from, all, from all shades and hues, that we actually start to talk to our children about what that means. I think one of the mistakes we make is to try to shut children down sometimes because we don't want them to be racist, right? So we're like, oh, that, that doesn't matter. Skin color doesn't matter, except that they're noticing it. So instead of shutting that down, invite it in, bring it into a conversation. Why do you think so many parents, they shy away from talking about their heritage? Important terms that I think we need to learn are really around the history of race. So where did race even come from, right? What does that even mean? Why is it so hard to talk about? Right? So there's a concept around that. And I think one of the things that people really have to start doing is, as parents is educating ourselves first. My biggest fear is like, as a father, all right? As a father talking about race to my children, I feel confident in the way in which I'm speaking about race to them, but I do feel like I'm in constant competition with the way in which they're visualizing race on social media. Well, I think, but this is, this is like everything else, right? You do your best as a parent, to give them a foundation, and then you have to kind of let them form their own beliefs and opinions. And I think one of the things that happens is if you 
if you try to take this on as a systemic conversation to start, it gets very complex. Yes. <laughs> you have to start with your children on a much simpler basis. Like with, wow. with yourself first. What's your own belief system? This is what daddy thinks. This is what daddy feels. For Sheila, for Myra, the same thing, right? This is how mommy feels. This is how mommy thinks about it, right? This is what mommy's experienced, right? First self, but I always tell parents that, what is your own belief first? Before you start talking about the whole rest of the world, cause then you're right, it gets very complex. When my kids were very little, you know, we never really talked about color of skin. We never really talked about, you know, the differences in people just because we saw people as people. Um, the way I grew up was because my mom was very fair skinned, and my dad was a little darker than me. We never really talked about race. We never really talked about those things. And so you never noticed even you growing up, right? Because I always say we start as parents first and then we can have a little bit more openness with our children, right? Mm -hmm. So you did you notice darker that your skin might have been browner or that your hair might have been a different texture? Did you notice that? Well, okay. of course we did, you know, in the Latino community, you know, with different people, they would say, oh, pero tú no tienes el pelo malo, and, you know, tú tienes la nariz this, and they would identify these little different things or nuances, as you say. Exactly. And that is talking right. about race without talking yes. about race. But we didn't really <laughs> talk about it. What well, we have to get to within our communities is the fact that we actually do talk about race, but we don't say that we're talking about race. Exactly, and that's yes. The, and that's the problem here. And really what we want to start to do with children is teach them. No, it doesn't matter, right? It doesn't matter that your hair is curly or that your hair or that your nose is white or you're still beautiful or whatever it might be depending on their age again, right? I think if we're going to talk about race within the Latino community, we have to talk about racism within the Latino community as well. But this is why I keep bringing you all back to your personal experience first, because until you've done that work within yourself, it's going to be hard to have the conversation with your children. Sheila, tell us a little bit about your experience. I have a daughter. She's 11 months old. How do I explain to her? Growing up, not when she's 15 and already thinks she looks horrible or she's not pretty how do i instill in her now so that at four at five at six at ten she already has that confidence right? i worry about that right like for my son who's a you know a little boy who's beautiful but he's half black and he's half Puerto Rican. so bringing it back to the children again like what is it that we can instill in children that's going to give them the confidence right mm -hmm. give help them to feel empowered help them to see themselves as beautiful and smart and intelligent and amazing mm -hmm. and all of those great things that any parent wants their child to feel about themselves. Mm -hmm. There's nothing wrong with saying, you know, there's gonna be people out there that don't think you're smart mm -hmm. because you're skin okay. brown. And I'm here to tell you that that's not true. How do we bring these stories into the, into the mix? How do we bring all of this history and richness in our culture to our children when there is so much lacking as far as representation on TV? There's, first of all, there's a ton of books there really are. There's a lot of books that I can, you know, that we can talk about. From early on, you start reading them stories. Okay. Spend time introducing them to different characters around diversity and race. I mean, there's some great books out there. Mm -hmm. There's other resources that are not necessarily the big, you know, media production resources, but that do have like documentaries and stories about about our heritage heritage, more of our heritage and our varying heritages, right? Because we're not all from the same place. Like they like to clump Ooh. us together as they know. Right? But even that, even that's a conversation. I, I discovered that I had to learn to build trust with my daughter right now, Alexa, my 15 year old, because she is questioning everything. So it's like more than ever right now. So she's over here like, dad, like, hey, I wanted to know a little bit more about like Chicanismo. You know, all of a sudden she's asking me questions about it. It's like, okay, she's really interested in Chicanismo. She's really interested in Latinidad. She's really interested in understanding what actually Black Lives Matters means. I'm in stage one with my son, Aaron, right now. I was in stage two with Eliana. Now I'm in stage three about race. With, with I'm talking about race to my daughter. Your oldest child, who's 15, has, the, has abstract thinking now. 
right? Mm-hmm. That's why I underestimated that. Why it's important to differentiate their age group, right? That's why I say when they're younger, you can read them stories. You keep the language very simple. You say, "Oh, mommy's skin is brown because grandma's skin was brown." Things like that, right? When they start to get into the age where you can, where they're thinking abstractly, developmentally, their brains are in a position to ab- to handle abstract thinking. Then you can talk more about the systemic stuff. You can bring in those kind of conversations. And I really want to, I love that you brought that in, Jorge, because I really, what I think, one of the biggest things I want to impart today is that don't underestimate our children's ability to understand mm-hmm. on a very fundamental level what is, what feels right or wrong to them. Okay, my three-year-old, I didn't realize this. He's only three years old. I underestimated the fact that he doesn't conceptualize the idea of age. He doesn't know what age means. All he sees is these taller people. He doesn't understand that we're older or smarter or anything. He just wants to be heard. He just wants to be understood. He feels like he's a little guy. Mm. And so I'm like, okay, with when, when we had that conversation about, as a family, how Aaron sees us, my wife and I and the kids were like, oh my god we just have to speak to him differently i used to do this with children and i worked with them in schools i used to come down to their height yes so you bring yourself down so you can have the conversation with them then you're not towering over them and they can express it, more, right because that's intimidating you're a little person and a big person up here looking that's down a at deal. you right it's so a big down. deal to them. It's, it's a big deal and that's and that's the whole point like we have to kind of I think as parents sometimes go back to where they were I told black lives matter situation and all the protests and stuff like that I noticed that she took the George Floyd situation to heart because between my the different complexions in my house my daughter is fair skin like my husband and my daughter is uh the nine-year-old is um darker skinned like me and i noticed that she would take things to heart you know especially with the race relations and stuff and she started asking me she's like mom because you know i'm dark like you does that mean that i'm gonna get picked on or that people are gonna discriminate against me and i i genuinely told her i'm like i don't think so i mean it could possibly happen but I told her I'm like but that's why it's important for you to know your value and to know that you shouldn't be basing people's value according to the color of their skin so that they won't base it for you on what your color of your skin is Mm -hmm. and then she kind of understood but it still kind of took a long time to grasp well I I think what she was really expressing was is she going to be safe like she's making it clear that she Mm -hmm. sees that the darker you are um, and her and what she's observing is that there's a potential for you to be harmed or to experience harm in a different way than if you're lighter, right? Or white skinned. And so that's what she's observing. And I think, again, in these cases, well, one of the things, you know, we're charged with as parents in general, but particularly with this topic is to try to give them some sense of security around their safety. Now, obviously we can't guarantee anything, right? And they're still gonna have to go out in the world and experience the world. But I think as a parent, you can say, I'm gonna do everything within my power to keep you safe. And another thing that she also mentioned was that she's like, mommy, I wanna go protest. How would you perceive that? And how do I not turn away the passion and drive that she has to make a difference? But, you know, she is also eight, nine years old. We're going through a pandemic. One of the things is transparency, right? Like, honesty, like, mommy would love if we could go out there and be part of the protest, but I don't think it's safe, you know, for your daughter that's immune compromised, right? So let's think about another way that we can contribute. But you're not taking away her passion. You're just giving her another way to channel the passion. Like they're they're pretty amazing, right? Mm-hmm. And so I think one of the one of the downsides of the way we've been parented even is this imposition of like I know what's best. Mm-hmm. Right? As opposed to inviting and encouraging children to come up with solutions. Mm-hmm. Let them be part of the solution, but also what we're doing is we're inviting in their creativity and their and their sense of empowerment. We can give them the space and the room to do that and not necessarily always have to have all the answers for them. 
because sometimes we don't have the answer and even that's okay it's okay to say you know what mommy doesn't really always know what to do about this mm -hmm. maybe we could think about it together let's see what we could come up with together right this like, is a good conversation y'all i think that sometimes we we just forget sometimes how important it is to to ground ourselves to really pay attention to how we speak to our kids i think what sheila was talking about is like the simplicity of sometimes it's just literal stuff we have to remember we have to just say okay look trust yourself that you're making the right judgment but i feel like if the fundamental part about like trusting your you building trust with your kids and teaching them que hablen bien and to have good rhetoric like it's beautiful to hear my my daughter say i want to know what's really going on because that's my opportunity to say okay it's time to teach her dialogue it's time to teach her how to defend herself with words she doesn't know it yet yeah and start the conversations early like very early on start those conversations it's never too young you know there's some great books out there i'll encourage you as a as families to talk about your racial identity and the complexity of it meaning you know we come from different parts of the world and this is how it and this is what happened in our history is starting to give our children the truth because they do go out into school and they learn something else. Mm -hmm. So we get to construct what we want now. That's part of the empowerment piece, right? Mm -hmm. Like, how do I, what do I want to take on? How do I feel empowered in this world? Mm -hmm. Including in my whatever blackness, whatever African ancestry I have, whatever indigenous ancestry I have. Mm -hmm. How do I want to use that to empower myself and empower others? And I think that's a conversation that we can keep having with our children. So thank you all for being here. This was fun. Thank you. I will cook a lot thank with you, you all forever. <laughs> that was a good, that was a hell of a conversation. Hey, that was so thank you, Cynthia. Thank you. Thank you all for being here, for being so open about this. Man, this stuff is not easy to talk about, right? Just to be able to be open about this is, is a, I think, big step number one. And really want to keep encouraging you with your children. And I bet you all amazing parents. I can just tell by how open you're being in this conversation. Follow like.